into the CFT, which we're also imagining factorizes. And um, so this is just a you know, qualitative picture of the setup at this point. But the claim of the theorem is that <coughs> these two statements are equivalent. And the, the first statement is this reconstruction statement that in this picture says if you have some operator phi acting a little b, then there exists some operator on capital B that reconstructs it in that precise sense of, um, you know, if I were to write, write it here, you know, there exists an O acting just on B such that this equation holds. for all psi in uh, H code. And um, likewise, it's important that you know, for any operator acting in B bar, little b bar, uh, that's reconstructible on capital B bar. Sorry, that was capital B bar. And um, the second one is the statement that if you compute the entropy of capital B, it's given by some formula like this. And so this is important for us because in ADS-CFT, we believe, we, know, you know, we have a formula like this. We know that we can compute the entropy of capital B using some prescription involving the bulk physics that finds some, what we call the quantum extremal surface, which is really you know, the minimal quantum extremal surface. And so <clears throat> this theorem tells us that if you find that, that divides the region uh, that capital B can reconstruct from the region that capital B bar can reconstruct. So that, that's the nice thing. And uh, I didn't say this, but there's language that people use in this context. So gamma, remember, was the quantum extremal surface. And then little b is sometimes, is sometimes called the entanglement wedge. I actually don't really like this name because it's very long and obscure. Um, so this is the entanglement, little b is like the entanglement wedge of capital B, and little b bar is the entanglement wedge of capital B bar. So this theorem goes by the name of entanglement wedge reconstruction. So whenever people talk about entanglement wedge reconstruction, you know, it's the statement that some CFT subregion can reconstruct operators in its entanglement wedge, and now you know what that means, and you have seen the theorem that shows it to be the case, at least in this sense that it can reconstruct operators that work on this bulk subspace. Um, I do need to say, uh, really, the entanglement wedge means, um, so here I'm just drawing a time slice. If I were to draw the full bulk picture, uh, where this time slice here is now this circle here, so little b is this guy and little b bar is this guy. Uh, capital B, the entanglement wedge is actually the full domain of dependence of little b. Which make, so like if you were to find the full domain of dependence of little b, it would sort of end on the domain of, you know, it, would, it would intersect the boundary at the domain of dependence of capital B. Um, so it's like a wedge. Uh, maybe it's, more obvious if I draw it, uh, if I, so if I were to consider this region, C, uh, and it's, it has a quantum extremal surface there, its entanglement wedge you know, hits the boundary like this. So it's like this full co-dimension zero region of the bulk that is really the entanglement wedge, but it's, defined, it's you know, uniquely picked out by how the entanglement wedge intersects this slice. So sometimes people will use this term to mean either one. But anyways, entanglement wedge reconstruction holds in either case. You know, if you have some operator uh, that's not, say, on this one particular time slice, but is further up somewhere else, still in this, this shaded wedge, C can still reconstruct it because, you know, in principle, you could have it can act any operator up here. You could have, say, evolved. You can just do it by reconstructing, say, any operator you want, even complicated ones on this time slice. 
uh, including sort of the Heisenberg ev evolved version of this phi back to the slice. So this is all just to say, even though I've been discussing things in terms of time slices, really when we think about reconstruction, some region, say B of the CFT, can reconstruct sort of an entire co-dimension zero region of the ADS, not just some operators on one time slice. Won't be super important for the rest, uh, but it is important to hear that. Okay, so then I mentioned after showing this theorem that, you know, in the assumptions of the theorem, we have this H code, which is a subspace, you should imagine as a subspace of HADS, and not the full bulk Hilbert space. Where you know, the full HADS, I'm taking to be the Hilbert space that has various black holes of different sizes, and the vacuum state, you know, there's a great many states. This H code was one where uh, the QES position for all intents and purposes didn't really change that much. So it's much smaller than this. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's a shortcoming because the operators that are guaranteed to exist on capital B that act like, say, this phi are only guaranteed by this theorem to act like that phi when acting on a state in this subspace. And, you know, maybe, that's just the, the fact of the theorem. And you might worry if that's, you might wonder, is that just um, a shortcoming of the theorem? Perhaps, you know, there's, perhaps there is a way in general to write on capital B this operator phi in a way that works for all bulk states. You know, that works for, for any state here, not just this limited fixed QES subspace that the theorem was talking about. Uh, but then we saw that that hope would be too ambitious. Um, this is where we started talking about quantum error correction, even though the, the a full exploration of quantum error correction and what it means would, would take a while. Um, the point I do want to emphasize, the point was that if indeed some subregion B, um, let's have B be big. B is two thirds of the boundary, say. So this is its quantum extremal surface. So its entanglement wedge is this big part. If there was some operator here phi. If B could always reconstruct this operator regardless of if, if we put like some black hole or something somewhere, um, there would be a problem. And the reason is that this theorem, you know, the reconstructions that were guaranteed uh, allows you to reconstruct phi on many different boundary regions. So not just this B, but also one that, uh, say, I'm outlining here in blue, and also different ones. So you can basically cut out any, say, third of the boundary and still find a way to reconstruct phi. If all of those reconstructions acted like phi on the entire Hilbert space, this would be a problem because as we argued, they would have to be, um, they would have to commute with every operator near the boundary and therefore every CFT operator. And that would mean that it would have to be trivial. So the upshot was that these reconstructions that you can do of an operator in the entanglement wedge, those reconstructions, um, you should really only trust them to work in the subspace and, and not expect them to work more generally outside of that. Okay, so that's just, that's just life. Um, it turns out that's how the ADS-CFT dictionary works is that the sort of operator reconstruction we want to do is, has this limit, has this limitation that the reconstructions we get sort of um, work at best nicely on a subspace. But that said, you know, it's certainly not clear from what I've said 
exactly how big that subspace can be. You know, maybe, you know, certainly they work on this fixed QES subspace, but maybe they work on something much bigger. I haven't, they can't work on everything, but, you know, what's the limit? <laughs> and uh, I haven't, I would say that's a, a question we basically understand now, but we'll have to build up some technology to answer it. So, my goal now is to say, given this, and given that, yeah, given that our goal was to talk about reconstructing operators that measured interesting things, like what happens inside of black holes, let's now ask if these reconstructions are sufficient. So they only work on some, say, fixed QES subspace so far, the ones that we're talking about. <clears throat> um, but maybe that's enough to start answering some interesting questions about black holes. But I'm going to now argue to you that it's not. We actually need to, to generalize. We need, a, we need a, say, a more powerful theorem that um, tells us what sort of reconstructions we can do outside of these fixed QES subspaces um, because the questions we want to ask about black holes can't be formulated in these fixed QES subspaces. So, I'll say it this way. There's more to life than fixed QES subspaces. And to argue this, I will just give you an example of some interesting physics that we would like to understand better and why we can't formulate, you know, physics that we can in principle understand uh, through this reconstruction idea. Um, but we can't, we can't find a fixed QES subspace in which this physical process lives. Okay. And that is uh, evaporating black holes. So the idea is this. So the, the basic overview of evaporating black holes uh, in ADS is the following. So let's say um, we have anti desitter space that has some star in it, or some, so let's say, dust cloud that's pretty big. Um, and it's, it's big enough that it, it collapses under its own weight and forms a black hole. Uh, the Penrose diagram for this might look like the following. So you can construct these metrics, um, what are they called? The Oppenheimer-Schneider collapse uh, is an example of this sort of thing. Uh, where, so this is a Penrose diagram where this wavy line here is the singularity. Uh, this dashed line here is the horizon of the black hole. Uh, this left line is not an asymptotic boundary. It's just, the, it's like the r equals zero point. This right side is the asymptotic boundary. So a CFT lives here. So, that, so this is a black hole in asymptotically anti desitter space. This is the uh, asymptotically ADS part. And then this shaded region here is this dust ball that was down here uh, collapsing under its own weight and then at some point um, you know, falls inside of its own Schwarzschild radius uh, at this point. And um, this is the causal structure given by this Penrose diagram. So <clears throat> let's just think about this. So this is a situation where we form a black hole. And if we make the dust cloud big enough, uh, it's what's called a large black hole, where the, the, the Schwarzschild radius is bigger than the ADS radius, that L that appeared in the, um, 
metrically wrote down for EBS. And so it's a, it's a big black hole. And, what's, and that fact will be important momentarily. So one thing Hawking taught us about black holes is, so we have this background, this geometry, and let's consider what the quantum fields are doing on top of it. And the important thing is that there are modes entangled across this horizon. So I'll, I'll draw it like this. So there's this mode, say, and this mode. Maybe there are two photons, and they're entangled. So I'll draw, the, I'll represent the entanglement by this dotted line connecting those guys. And this guy is outside the horizon, and this guy is inside. And this guy will escape all the way to the asymptotic boundary, whereas this guy cannot. He will eventually hit the singularity. And this is what an observer, say, who's floating out here near the boundary, or maybe living at the boundary, would observe as Hawking radiation. So he would, he would see all these photons hitting him, um, and that would be Hawking radiation to him. And now usually, when we have ADS, we, um, you know, we have to choose what the boundary conditions are at asymptotic infinity. And often we choose reflecting boundary conditions. And in that case, um, this photon would hit the asymptotic boundary and then bounce off and fall back into the black hole. And so even though the black hole sort of lost energy for a bit, a bit of time, as this photon um, flew away, the, pho the photon hits asymptotic infinity and bounces back in finite um, time relative to the you know, the black hole. Um, this, is a, this is a fact, actually, that's true in ADS, and I don't think I said it, which is that um, if you have some observer, say, floating in the middle of ADS, and then, say, they shot a laser uh, towards the boundary, radially outwards, uh, and then they continued to float in ADS, uh, even though there's infinite spatial volume, Space is sort of uh, crunching in, in the sense, it, you know, sort of it in the opposite way to, to sit or expanding, such that this laser would actually be able to go and hit the boundary, and in this case, reflect off of it because of these reflecting boundary conditions, and then re-hit the observer, who is staying at r equals zero, uh, in a definite finite amount of the observer's proper time. So, that same effect means that the black hole is going to radiate, have its radiation hit the boundary and fall back in. So, uh, and any black hole that's big enough, so a large black hole where its short child radius is larger than the ADS radius, will be large enough to be effectively, sta to be stable under this process so that it's not gonna shrink and radiate away like black holes in flat space. That's what usually happens, because we usually choose reflecting boundary conditions. But now we're gonna choose different boundary conditions, because we wanna talk about evaporating black holes. This is um, a thing that you know, became very popular in 2019, um, with these page curve calculations, if you've heard of those. Um, we're gonna choose boundary conditions, such that when a photon hits the boundary, it, it has some chance that we can make pretty large to pass through it and into some, some bath, say. We'll call this the bath or the, or the reservoir. Maybe the reservoir is a better name. If I can spell it. And this will be, uh, it doesn't need to be gravitational. It can just be some non-gravitational uh, flat space region. So the, the photon passes through the boundary and then so maybe when it hits here, it appears here. Um, and now it's just gonna live in this flat space, non-gravitational region for the rest of its life. And so this is, by choosing these boundary conditions, this is a way for us to allow this black hole in ADS to radiate and um, eventually evaporate. So this radiation passes through to this reservoir, the black hole loses energy, and will get smaller and smaller, just like black holes evaporating in flat space. And uh, what's especially nice about this is that you know, more and more radiation will accumulate um, in the reservoir, so it's not like we're just losing track of it. It's passing into here, and then later we can, say, ask about its entropy or 
you know, ask about what the state of the, ra the radiation is, et cetera. Yes. Sorry, I guess you, you still have a problem with unitarity even if you don't put a bath, no, because even if the black hole doesn't radiate, if you start from like a pure state mm -hmm. and it starts like radiating away, and even if the radiation comes back into the black hole, I guess you don't, you don't have a pure state anymore, no? So is yeah. this bath really, uh, I understand that with the bath you can let it evaporate, but is this bath really necessary to talk about unitarity? Uh, I think you could formulate the information paradox without the bath. The bath just helps make it very sharp. Okay. Yeah. And it'll make this question of um, trying to reconstruct operators in the black hole interior that I want to talk about very sharp as well. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I would like to ask, uh, maybe I missed the point uh, you said, but uh, how can you say that uh, after this process of uh, uh, somehow mirroring the, the radiation, at infinity, at the bound, at infinity boundary, how, how can you um, somehow uh, say the black hole is stable, is, there is no somehow, in literature, in literature there's this name of the bomb, uh, yeah, the black hole is unstable, it somehow collapses under this uh, radiation. So, uh, yeah. so I'll say, say is there's a, a super radiance, something like super radiance, that this radiation uh, in, increases uh, and uh, the, the, the black hole collapses. Yeah, it's, it's very much worth a detailed calculation to understand which black holes will stick around um, and which black holes will evaporate. So it's, um, you can do this sort of, yeah, this calculation of the thermodynamic stability of black holes of different sizes, and you'll find that ones that are uh, larger than the ADS radius will be stable. And then this is the picture for why that is. Is there a CFT interpretation of these other non-reflecting boundary conditions? Yes, that CFT interpretation is that you are um, introducing some like local coupling between the CFT and some other quantum system that might be like you know, you're adding to your Lagrangian some some operator like some some uh, operator like this. Um, uh, I guess you have to integrate over x or something. Uh, maybe you want to do it like this. Or yeah, so some like local coupling with some perhaps small parameter G uh, connecting points in the CFT to points in the reservoir. Just to go back a few minutes to your earlier pictures, um, can you like reverse the statement and say that if I would want a perfect reconstruction on the full bulk Hilbert space, I automatically, I necessarily need the full boundary or something. I cannot do that in any subregion. <laughs> Good. So um, it it won't be enough to even have the full boundary, and that is actually exactly the point that I want to argue, uh, and momentarily. So so for example, in this case, just to look ahead five minutes, it will be the case that we will find black hole states where even though you have the entire CFT, you can't reconstruct operators acting in that, inside that black hole. And so, wrestling, so, so noticing that and wrestling with this question of when can you reconstruct what operators, even using the whole CFT, will motivate us to start talking about generalizations of this theorem and um, how we can understand what's going on. I think there's a question there. Um, when do we, do we, we use this boundary condition? Is uh, holographic renormalization and so on and so forth still under control, or we don't yes, know? Yes, that's a great question. Um, yes, I, I um, yeah, so I think to do it formally, you have to be careful about this, where you actually imp impose these boundary conditions at some epsilon distance, uh, important grade coordinates, so at some very large distance in radial um, units. And, uh, and then you're going to so couple something very close, some surface very close to the asymptotic boundary to some surface here. And then you're going to, at the end, take some limit uh, where it goes to the asymptotic boundary and be careful about these divergences. Yeah. And, and it's still under control as far as I understand. Good. So, so, um,
So we have these evaporating black holes, and then there's various paradoxes that show up when you have evaporating black holes, like the information paradox. And more recently, 2012, there was this famous firewall paradox, which um, I won't describe in detail here. But I will say there's questions about after the black hole has been evaporating for a long time, what does the interior look like? Is it still well described by this geometric picture we've drawn where you know, it suggests that some observer could, um, say, fall in and basically see the geometric interior that Einstein's equations would have predicted? Or is something more dramatic happening where maybe there's a, you know, a breakdown in the space-time connectivity between the interior and exterior after the black hole has been evaporating. You know, some, maybe there's some like wall of fire or firewall that shows up there. And this might seem like a very dramatic thing. There's very interesting arguments that suggest that this could happen for all we know. And we might be interested in settling the debate by reconstructing some operator that acts here maybe some number operator to, you know, we want to consider this guy here that could, in principle, detect if there's a firewall, reconstruct him in the boundary, and then just evaluate his expectation value in the CFT state. And then if it comes out to, to zero, you know, these modes are in their vacuum state, then we would say there's no firewall. Um, and so that's the sort of thing we might like to do so we want to consider reconstructing operators in these evaporating black holes. <clears throat> the problem is that if I draw a time slice now, you'll see that it's not so obvious that we can reconstruct these operators in the black hole using the CFT. So this is now the black hole. So I'm drawing, say, this time slice. And so this dot here, remember, is that whole outer circle. Uh, this dashed line intersecting this time slice is this horizon. So I could be consistent with that if I made this dashed, perhaps. So this is, this is the horizon of the black hole. And some operator that I might want to reconstruct is, say, this operator right here, phi. And the question is, if I let capital B be my entire boundary, can I reconstruct this operator phi on capital B. Phi, which is in the black hole, on B. And the reason this is subtle is that you know, in this situation, the black hole has been evaporating for a very long time, and there's a bunch of modes. So looking at this Penrose diagram, all of these interior partners, uh, you know, it evolved them forward in time. There's a bunch of partners living on this, this time slice. So I'll draw them here. And the reservoir, maybe I'll draw, I don't know, here. This is the reservoir. It also has a bunch of, yeah. okay, so this time slice, maybe I should continue drawing like this. So this is, this is a time slice. Maybe I'll use a different color to emphasize the time slice I'm considering, this orange slice. And, so we had a, and this time slice of the reservoir, there's also a bunch of modes. They're all entangled with modes in the black hole. Lots of entanglement. And then, so now, the basic lesson of theorem one was we can reconstruct operators in the interior. Um, you know, we can re reconstruct this phi if phi lives in the entanglement wedge of B. So we need to find the position of the quantum extremal surface of B and see if it includes phi. So, and now there's some subtlety of the, are we in a fixed QES subspace? Let's forget that for now. 
let's just ask this, this more basic question. Is phi in the entanglement wedge? That at least needs to be true if we're going to reconstruct it. So from theorem one, what we know to ask Uh, so if phi is acting at, I don't know, some point x, we'll just say is x in the entanglement wedge of capital B. Um, and the answer is, if this black hole has you know, is old enough if it's been evaporating for half its life, then no. And I'm going to argue that. So the answer is no if the black hole is too old. So the reason is that we just want to take B and we want to consider all of the surfaces gamma homologous to B that uh, are quantum extremal. And then if there are multiple, we want to pick the minimal one. And so, it turn, so the most obvious surface gamma homologous to B, because B is the entire CFT, is the trivial surface. You know, if you, we're asking about the geometry on this orange slice here. So if I just pick no surface at all, gamma is empty. That's clearly homologous to B because B already bounds this whole slice. So you don't need to add anything to make it bound a region. Um, so, so if we're listing candidate quantum extremal surfaces, candidate one, the first one we would think of is uh, you know, gamma is, is uh, the empty set. Okay, but what is, but in this case, what would the entropy of B, of capital B, uh, be? So remember, it's, it's always equal to the area of gamma over 4G plus the von Neumann entropy of the entanglement wedge. And so because gamma is empty, this term is zero. That's good. I mean, that already seems like this is going to be the minimal one. Uh, also, I, I didn't say this. It's, it's extremal because um, the empty set it has a very easy time being extremal. Um, but okay, so this, it, this this is good. This term is usually very large. The fact that it's zero means that it has a good chance of being the minimal QES. Uh, but what is this guy? Uh, this guy is actually very large if the black hole is old. And that's because he is counting uh, the entire entropy of the bulk, so the entropy of all the matter fields on this orange slice, which includes the entropy of all of these interior Hawking modes, which are entangled with these guys here. So all of that entanglement right, means there's a lot of von Neumann entropy of these guys. I uh, realize I never, I haven't like computed a von Neumann entropy for you all, so some of you might not have seen that. But the idea is that if you took, say, two systems that are maximally entangled, uh, the von Neumann entropy of both of them together is zero. The von Neumann entropy of any pure state is zero. But the von Neumann entropy of one of those systems alone is very large. It's like maximal. It's like log of the dimension of that Hilbert space. Um, so, so if there, if, if if the black hole has been evaporating for a long time, there's a lot of interior Hawking partners, uh, and so these guys all contribute a lot of entropy to S of little b. So it's large. Okay. So are there any other candidates for what the QES could be? Yes, there is, and uh, it's uh, the, the other one is that gamma could basically um, be the black hole horizon. 
So technically, it's not exactly on the horizon. Um, for details, I'm not going to get into. But it turns out that there is another. So uh, when the black hole is old, this surface, this green surface, um, that's basically, it's, I should have drawn it just inside the horizon, like just barely inside, um, is extremal. That's a very non-trivial claim. And it was the, it was the, I'll write it here. So extremal was uh, figured out by these 2019 papers. So the fact that there's this green surface that is extremal very close to the horizon and these evaporating black holes um, was argued very nicely by these two papers from 2019, one by Jeff Pennington and then one by um, Almeri, Engelhart, Meroff, and Maxfield. Uh, they came out the same day. So it's a very non-trivial claim that that guy's extremal. But if you trust me that he's extremal under local perturbations, I, I can easily argue to you that he's more minimal than gamma uh, at a certain point. Because um, you know, if, if we pick this guy as the QES, then what would S of capital B be? Well, again, remember it's A of gamma over 4G plus S of little b. Um, but so now this guy, A of gamma, is large, right? It's like the area of the black hole. So, so this term is contributing area of the black hole over 4G Newton, much larger than zero. But this guy is now very small, or zero. Uh, and the reason is that if the green guy is the QES, then the entanglement wedge of capital B, right, the region little b, is the, is the region between the green surface and the asymptotic boundary. So it's, it's this region out here, which excludes all of these really entropic modes in the inside. So this is a competition. When you're, so there's two candidate quantum extremal surfaces. And effectively, as the black hole is radiating early in its life, this one is the minimal one. And then later on, this one becomes the minimal one. Um, because this term, S of little b, uh, here is growing. Um, meanwhile, this term is not growing. Because, uh, but this guy is shrinking. Because the black hole is radiating, and so the area of the black hole is shrinking with time. So this, this guy, this is shrinking, this is growing. So at some point, they cross. And um, so the point is that if you were asking to the point uh, at some time, which is called the page time, which is about halfway through the evaporation process, the uh, interior is no longer in the entanglement wedge, which I'll write as EW, of B. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the point of this example. Um, and that's very important because if we want to ask, again, it, you know, it's after this time that we would be worried there's a firewall, but we can't reconstruct the operator phi on capital B at that time. Um, which means we can't directly test it by acting some CFT operator. And, uh, you know, in fact, some people even so might kind of asked, does this mean that, in fact, there is a firewall because it's, you know, exactly at the page time? Um, it seems like B is losing the ability to reconstruct this operator. Maybe that's because that space-time region is destroyed. Uh, we're going to take a different point of view. But. Uh, so what you're doing is that you're erasing uh, the information inside the black hole and you're putting it into a reservoir which we don't have access to. And then you say that, okay, when uh, the information, when I lose information more than half, I don't have access to it. So 
it's somehow obvious from the first place. Isn't it better to actually scramble the data and put it somewhere inside the bulk and then? Yeah, good. So, good, good, good. So I think what you're getting at is, um, you know, in this setup, maybe we should have expected that at some point, capital B can't reconstruct this operator because we've been putting a lot of uh, information here in the reservoir. Maybe we should try, be trying to reconstruct the interior using the reservoir and capital B. And in fact, that's true. And, and that we're, gonna, um, we're going to uh, understand explicitly what's going on uh, with that. I, I think this is an informative example because prior to this sort of thought experiment, you might have thought that the CFT can always reconstruct any operator in the bulk. But then now we're seeing if there's enough entanglement between this and some external system, then that naive expectation breaks down. And so there's something more sophisticated that's true. And uh, we want to understand what that more sophisticated statement is. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Maybe you said it, but where did the homology constraint go? Uh, for the second surface? The homology constraint uh, is, is there. It's very important uh, because this green guy is homologous to B um, because this region little b is bounded by this green guy in capital B. Um, I, I thought, like, for example, in the just the region of Rio Takanaki, you would, uh, if you had the whole B, you would just stay at the horizon because you could not go inside because of the homology constraint? Is, is this uh, incorrect? Uh, yes. so or? That um, argument was about the two-sided black hole where it couldn't, you had another boundary that you had to, you know, you had to divide somewhere between the two boundaries. Uh, that's why it hugged the horizon. So the point here is that we're single-sided, so this thing. Exactly, okay. yeah, because we're single-sided, you know, this is the geometry of the time slice. So it has no trouble shrinking to zero. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> so uh, at the page time, you jump, uh, the, the minimal surface jumps from uh, type 1 to, to 2. Um, so a piece of confusion is that one second before page time, you can reconstruct the operator, and one second after, uh, you say, no, I cannot reconstruct it anymore, but probably uh, you can still almost... Uh, yeah, good. So, uh, I mean, with yeah. very good accuracy, you can still reconstruct it. Good. So, yeah, yeah, right. So, um, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, this sharp, it's not a sharp division. There's a, what really happens is that when we talk about reconstruction, we should be careful and say, you know, to what extent does the left side equal the right side? And usually there's some very small corrections, but um, near the page time, the corrections add up and become large and, and sort of a continuous, in a continuous way. Um, that people have calculated um, very exactly. So, like in this West Coast toy model, they like, you know, they, they do this very explicitly, and they compute the reconstruction fidelity as a function of where you are in the page curve. And uh, so, yeah, what happens is that actually you stop being able to reconstruct phi, sort of before the page time. So after the page time, you, uh, yeah, uh, by the page time exactly, uh, you you can't reconstruct it. And then so after you can't either. So, yeah. Good. Um, so uh, another thing I want to point out about this. Uh, so, so the main moral was that, you know, it's not just as simple as we, I think, at all thought originally that using capital B, you could just always reconstruct any operator in the interior. There's something more complicated. You know, in this state, can't, you have trouble reconstructing this phi. Um, but you know, perhaps, and it turns out to be true, if you tried to also, you know, if you tried to like act some operator on capital B and the reservoir, you could reconstruct phi. Something like that is true. Um, but we want to understand that. Um, you know, it might be surprising because the reservoir doesn't have to be some holographic CFT. It's just an arbitrary system. So, um, so we want to understand what's going on here. Another thing that's important is that it illustrates <laughs> that the, there's important questions that don't live in what I was calling 
a fixed QES subspace. Because this is one state, these old black holes, where the quantum extremal surface is this green surface. There it is. But there's another state, like a younger black hole, uh, or if you, let me, maybe I'll say it this way. You take a black hole of the same size as this old black hole, but instead of having all of these modes be entangled with these guys, you have them all be in some pure state that you choose. So the geometry is the same to a, a, a controlled approximation. And, um, but because these guys are, are in a pure state, not in some state entangled with something else, uh, their contribution to the bulk entropy would be very small. And the minimal QES would again be the empty set. So this illustrates that you, know, you can have some black hole of a given size. If that black hole is in a pure state, uh, the quantum extremal surface would be the empty set. If the black hole were in some highly entangled state with something else, then the quantum extremal surface could be very much not the empty set. It could be this. So this whole situation, I have a black hole. Maybe it's in this state or that state. doesn't live in a fixed QES subspace. One state has one QES, another state has another QES. Okay. Um, so to handle this, what we want to do first is just uh, understand if you know if the quantum you know what we're going to do is see a generalization of theorem one, and we're going to see that the quantum extremal surface is still a helpful guide towards what is reconstructible and what's not, even outside of the fixed QES uh, assumption. After seeing this theorem, what we'll do next time is we'll see a nice model of how this all fits together. So in that model um, is some recent work uh, that goes by the name non-isometric codes. So it'll be a nice um, model that can explain, you know, by understanding this model, you'll see sort of the physics that's going on here and, and how the information shifts from B to the reservoir and so on. But first things first. And this is a theorem that was um, written by um, me and uh, Jeff in 2021. And it's uh, just the theorem that you get when you take this theorem written in 2016 and you lift the fixed QES assumption. So again, we're going to let uh, there be one Hilbert space that we'll call H that factorizes like this into B and B bar. This is, remember, morally like the C of T. And there's also, as before, going to be some code subspace that we'll imagine factorizes, say, like this, into little b and little b bar. But now there's something different that we're going to do here. So, Instead of being some fixed QES subspace, it's like an arbitrary subspace of uh, HADS. And this is the big difference. Um, moreover, what we're going to do is we're going to allow, I mentioned this yesterday, but we're going to allow there to be some more structure here. Let me write this in red. Um, so HB can further factorize if you want into H little b1, tensor H little b2, uh, and so on, to H little bn. And uh, Likewise here, so I'll write ditto. 
Um, maybe that those I'll call h little b bar one and h little b bar two and so on. So those could factorize more. And the picture for this that you should have in mind, let me draw it here. Is say that you have uh, saying this is b bar and this is b, so b is this guy, and um, you know, there's going to be there's going to be some quantum extremal surface. I'll draw it there. It's not yet shown up in the statement of the theorem, uh, and so this is morally like little b, and this is morally like little b bar. Um, but we're going to allow there to be you know, what we will imagine as little bulk points. So this might be little b1, little b2, and, uh, and so on. Maybe this is little bm. This guy could be uh, little b bar 1, little b bar 2, and so on. Um, they don't have to have the same number of points. And so that's the setup here. Uh, this, you'll see why this extra factorization is nice to have. Uh, you don't have to you assume that it has any, but if you do, you get some nice extra statement out of the theorem. Uh, and both of these are finite dimension Hilbert spaces. And um, again, we're going to let V be some map that embeds this H code into H. So right, it just takes your ADS states to your CFT states. And then finally, we're going to let uh, there be some, some state that we're talking about, which we'll call psi, which is some state on little b, little b bar r. So it's a state in H code tensor HR. R, this, is, this HR is a new system that I'm going to call the reference system or the reservoir. Um, and it's just there for generality. It's, it's nice to have. Um, you could, if you want, remove any mention of R in the statement. The theorem would still be true, but not as general. So you can just have some extra reference system R lying around. And the state psi could be a state in which all, you know, little b and little b bar are, say, entangled with R. And now before I can tell you the statement of the theorem, so this, these are the assumptions, but I actually need to define something. So there is um, what I'm going to call oh, I'm going to call u little b prod or product. This is, I'll call these product unitaries. And it's going to be any unitary, say, that's acting on little b, that factorizes among all the, among this, this, uh, you know, this given factorization here. So u prime is just indicating that it doesn't need to be the same unitary as u just a different unitary possibly. So a product unitary is just, it's a unitary on B1, tensored with a unitary on B2, and so on. These can be the identity or not. They can all be non-trivial. But they, in particular, are not a unitary that's acting on B1 and B2. So you know, it can't, say, create entanglement between these two factors. All it can do is just adjust them all in a factorized way. So this is what I'll mean when I write Something like this. And then the statement, I'll write here. That the, the, again, we have two things that are equivalent. And they're, it's very much 
analogous to this theorem, but it's slightly different. So the first is that um, it's again a reconstruction statement. And the statement is that for any, you know, if you take this psi, the psi that showed up that we wrote there, and you act any product unitary on B, little b, and then map it to the boundary Hilbert space, you could have gotten the same state if you had taken psi, first mapped it to the boundary Hilbert space, and then acted some operator that exists on capital B. This unitary doesn't have to be a product. It's a general unitary on B. Um, we didn't assume any particular, like, there's no statement here about a particular decomposition of capital B. So this is the statement you get. It's the, uh, you know, it's, you know, really, I should say, for all product unitaries on little b, sorry, this is very small. This just says, for all product unitaries on little b, there exists a unitary on capital B such that this is true. So this is like the reconstruction statement in one, except instead of being able to reconstruct an operator, uh, you know, given any operator on little b, capital B can reconstruct it. This is saying capital B can reconstruct these product unitaries in this uh, way where it does the right thing on psi. And if I have time, I, yeah, I'm really, I'm gonna emphasize why it has these extra restrictions um, and, and why that's okay. So also, if this is true if you replace capital B with B bar R and little b with, um, little b bar. Uh, I'm gonna put R as here as well. Um, so this is another difference is here where when you swap out B for B bar, it should come with the reference system. This is very much related to the fact that here, whenever, uh, whenever B, capital B couldn't reconstruct something, what could reconstruct it is the entire complementary region, not just its complement in the CFT Hilbert space, which was empty, there's no B bar, but also the entangled re uh, reservoir. So here, that's why it, the R is showing up. So a question. Yeah. Um, so this product structure, this restriction on U, uh, is, is it a proxy for a locality when the little n goes to infinity or? or, or no? Yeah, that's, that's the idea, yeah. It's a proxy for locality when little n goes to infinity, yeah. It's, um, that's a good way to say it, yeah. So um, the reason why it ends up being this product structure is that you, right, you can't reconstruct a general unitary because that could change the entanglement in a way that dramatically moves the quantum extremal surface. And I'll try and explain that um, later. But the second statement is that, is one that's like the quantum extremal surface. So it says that you can compute the entropy of B and the state psi, so if you take psi, which is the bulk state, map it with V to the boundary, and you compute the entropy of capital B, it's given by, again, um, this expectation value, or let me write it this way. The expectation value of some area operator, uh, but now one that depends explicitly on little b, so there's a different one for different, different little b's um, plus the von Neumann entropy of little b and the state psi. But condition two is not just this. Turns out you have to uh, add in this further statement that for all product unitaries on little b, 
and product unitaries on little b bar, um, which I'll, I'll just I'll just write u to be these guys for the moment. This equation holds for any u acting on psi. Um, so this is still very much like the quantum extremal surface formula that we have in ADS-CFT, even though we don't usually talk about their you know, product unitaries and this formula holding for all, not just the state we're considering, but for all product unitaries acting on it. it but that is true, um, because these product unitaries don't change the entanglement, so they don't change the position of the QES. But, so this is, in some sense, a technical detail, um, but it is what shows up here. Finally, let me say that um, there's a third condition, which is an improvement upon theorem one in the sense that, recall theorem one, even though it was supposed to be talking about the quantum extremal surface formula, nowhere did it say anything about extremality or minimality. Now, we are going to get this minimality. And uh, that's condition three. And it turns out that the, the correct logical structure is not that there's some equivalence between this three I'm about to write and one and two. So these, are, these one and two are equivalent, but they imply three. The converse is not true. And so the three is the statement that um, this, like, this A of little b plus S of little b evaluated in psi is less than or equal to A of what I'll call B prime plus S of B prime evaluated in the state psi um, uh, for all B prime. So B prime here is an arbitrary other choice. So in this, you know, if this region defined by this surface is little b, little b prime is just any other choice of these factors. So maybe, maybe b prime defined by this purple surface, includes this thing we're calling little b bar two and little b bar one, but excludes b two and whatever that guy is. And um, so maybe all, the union of all of these points is b prime. And given this guy and the state psi, you could evaluate his area plus his bulk entropy. And this theorem guarantees you that will be greater than the one for little b, if little b is the region that satisfies this formula and the reconstruction thing. So this is like, this is, this is a lot like the quantum extremal surface formula. That the quantum extremal surface formula said, if you find the, the region that satisfies this, it will be the minimal QES. And this is saying the same thing if you forget that the time direction exists. So there's so far, no statement about extremality in the time direction, but this is the statement of uh, extremality in the spatial direction. So that's what we have so far. This is the statement of theorem two. And um, there's two things I haven't really explained to you about it. So the first is what this guy is. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you that there's just a natural guy that shows up here. He's uniquely defined. He, he, he's unique. Um, it's very nice. He generalizes the A that showed up there. But um, the A that showed up there was just some, in theorem one, was just the, some area that, that was just a fixed operator. Um, there was no way to talk about the area of other regions. There was no way to even, you know, the only regions that were defined in the bulk were little b and little b bar. In the theorem two, there, are, there is a way to talk about other regions. That's very important because you know, one state, psi, might have entanglement wedge little b. A different state, psi prime, might have a different entanglement wedge, little b prime. But we need to talk about, a way to talk about the fact that they have different entanglement wedges um, 
and the areas of both of those. So that's why there's this new uh, structure showing up, this area operator. There's an area defined for every surface. And given more time, I would explain to you the, uh, why this totally makes sense as the, the type of reconstruction that shows up. Um, because I am a little short on time, what I will say instead is that this is, this is the type, you know, this theorem tells you that in general, this is what the quantum extremal surface formula promises you can do uh, as, as far as reconstruction. And you might be disappointed because you might want to do things other than just use capital B to reconstruct product unitaries on little b. You know, maybe phi here, the guy that measures if there's a firewall, is maybe not a product unitary. But I would say don't be dismayed. There are nice theorems you can prove, and I could write one down, um, where the idea is that if you can reconstruct product unit, like a, yeah. Let's say you have a subspace. So how do I want to say this? This isn't all you can do. So this theorem isn't telling you that this is the most you can do. What this theorem is telling you is that, you know, given that this, you, have, you know the QES of one region and one state, you can do this. Um, but if you know more, for example, if you know that, say, um, the interior of the black hole is in the entanglement wedge, of capital B for all states in some subspace, then that tells you, you can take that statement combined with statement one and learn a more powerful reconstruction statement. So this is like a, a reconstruction primitive and you can combine it with other things you know to argue that you can do more complicated types of reconstruction um, so the upshot is that uh, this, this, okay, so this is capturing what the QS formula tells you about reconstruction, um, but it's not supposed to be obvious just from looking at this uh, what all of the operators are that you can reconstruct, say, using capital B or using just the reservoir or using both together, say, what operators in the interior you can reconstruct. To answer that question, we'll need to dive a little deeper into um, this example, which we'll do next time. So for now, uh, yeah, the takeaway is we have a theorem sort of telling us what the QES formula says about reconstruction. Let's use that theorem next time, say, in a model that we fully understand to understand exactly what we can reconstruct in the interior of a black, uh, evaporating black hole. Okay, thank you. Good questions? Uh, maybe you said it and I lost it, but um, so in the candidate QES, like candidate number two, uh, you said it's a surface which is very close to the black hole horizon. And uh, so should I think it's something that uh, nucleates behind the horizon after a finite time or it's just yeah. something that is tracking the horizon in some way? It, it, it turns out to be something that sort of nucleates behind the horizon. It sort of nucleate, this, the, this extremal surface nucleates there after, after some amount of time. But before it becomes minimal. So it's, it's, uh, its behavior is sort of different in different examples, but generally it shows up, is not yet minimal, and then at some point becomes minimal. Yeah. Yeah.
Maybe I can ask a question. Uh, so is it true that this H little b in principle might have different factorization? I could try to factor it some other way. Uh, yeah, you could always, I guess, you know. Um, so my, my question would be we, which parts of this theorem would depend on the choice of the factorization or? Uh, yeah, good. So, <clears throat> so this theorem is always uh, true for any factorization that you write. But in ADS, you know, if we want to apply it to ADS-CFT, um, we need to just note there that this formula holds for um, little b's that are defined well by some spatial factorization. So the spatial factorization is just important because that's the one that seems to be relevant to this formula in ADS-CFT. Um, but in principle, it could be a different factorization in a different system. Thanks. Oh. Um, when we do one such computation with black holes, like the, the one you did before, what kind of black hole we can consider? So any kind of black hole or small black holes or do we have some limitation on temperature or on charges or something like that? Yeah, um, yeah, all of these can sort of change the details, but um, I would say the, so the first studied examples were these large black holes that would normally be stable with reflecting boundary conditions, but can evaporate with this coupling to the reservoir. Uh, you could also, I think, you could do a small black hole, which would maybe be simpler, because it, it will evaporate um, already with reflecting boundary conditions. Um, I think the reason people talk about that less is that it's harder to do a computation that, say, gives you this so-called page curve. Um, you know, it's, it's harder to compute the von Neumann entropy of the radiation um, because you have to somehow like isolate the radiation and compute its entropy. And if it's not if you're not isolating it into some other system, that's more difficult. So, oh, but yeah, so you could have like, yes, you could have black holes that have various charges, et cetera, and that does change the details, but not the qualitative behavior. Uh, that are very close to extremality, yeah. So, so those, right, um, you know, how quickly these black holes evaporate, uh, these sorts of details do depend on this fact. Um, the fact, the basic qualitative behavior is the same, that they eventually evaporate and, uh, you know, therefore build up this large entanglement between the inside and the exterior radiation. That, that stays the same. Uh, what is the A in the last statement? Is it the expectation value of the A. Yeah, sorry. This was supposed to be the same. Uh, AC, so thank you. Any further question? Okay, if not, let's have a break now, and then we start again at 3.30.